trying to kind of do research. And in two years, we reached this point. Like Mike Cosay uh, off my going down at last May and testifying before the House and Judiciary Committee. Then the president signed the bill into law uh, July 31st, and then Los Angeles, uh, and borrowing some of the strategy they've developed because their move is 38, 39 years old, while the Aleut is only a little over two years. Okay. This is a warm up. We're just getting my clubbers right. at this point. Okay. But that that's what I wanted to talk about. Okay. <clears throat> if it's all right with you. Yeah, oh that's yeah, fine. Father, would you like to say anything along those lines from the point of view as a commissioner? Which and, and if you see yourself as separate in a role of commissioner is one and the same, having gone through it and that's why you're there or, or that Well I was told by uh, API eight Fix my name. Well, that's uh, first. Uh, uh, Phil came and asked me if I wanted to be, you know, in on it. I said okay. Then it turned in my name to uh, Senator Stevens, and he uh, gave it to people in Washington D.C. And they, they said okay. So I was called, and, and in February, or on February 28th, I went to uh, back to Washington D.C. at Rwanda. At first, he started off as a seven-member commission. He decided to have nine. So. Um, at the time of the war, you were residing in, uh, in on Alaska, Saint Paul. Saint Paul. Paul. Phil. Yes, I was living in Alaska, and I had just completed uh, eight years of grade school. We were looking forward to going to the Sheldon Jackson High School. Gertrude? I was also here in Alaska. Alfred? I was living in Alaska at the time. Okay, one other thing I'm going to ask you. Before. Phil? August 12th, 1927. Gertrude. January 1st, 1930. You're a baby. Uh -huh. <laughs> Boy, I would guess. <laughs> Who was it? Okay. What we're doing right now is just getting reaction shot that, that the sound isn't being used just for later on for editing purposes. And then after it's all over, we'll do some more of these things. Um, okay, why don't we start then? Phil, give you a, a just let you rave here for a bit. Okay. And um, then we'll go to the father. Okay. Gertrude. And then Alfred. Or would you like to? Phil, you open with your piece. We'll go to the father for his introduction piece. Let's come back to you and then talk about the experience. Then to the father for experience. Gertrude. Alfred. Okay, can we do it that way? Yeah. Because you're, you're talking separate now. It's a separate piece, okay. isn't it, really? <coughs> Unless you want to, yeah. It has to be separate. Because the way I see this going in would be over, over footage of the locations down southeast, the main body of what we're going to hear tonight. Okay. And it would probably be inappropriate to drop in. Hey, Bill. Okay, my name is Phil Turdyakoff. I'm born and raised in Unalaska, and I live in Unalaska. Father? My name is Father Ishmael Gromov. I was born in St. Paul Island, Pribilovs. Came down to Alaska as a priest in 1966. And I live here. Father, where were you born? Pribilov, St. Paul. Okay. okay. Gertrude? My name is Gertrude Savarni, and I was born and raised in Alaska and moved out for a while, and my husband and I just moved back last fall. Is your husband also? <coughs> Oh, he's from Wisconsin. <laughs> Wisconsin, okay. <laughs> Alfred. I'm Alfred Stephen Ray, uh, born in Alaska, but now uh, residing in Anchorage. How are we doing, Greg? Okay, Hello. we're going to start with Phil. Piece from Phil, then we're going to go to the father, <clears throat> and then back to Phil, and the father again, and then Gertrude, Al, and then after that it's going to be an open 
freeway discussion. What, what, what do you expect us to say this first time? Well, Phil's going to give a piece about how this whole project yeah, started. I understand that. I'll, I'll throw you a question. I'll throw you a question. Okay. Phil. Yes. As an alternate board member to the Aleutian Pueblo Off Islands Association, I was informed by the executive director at that time that he was going to try go to Washington, D.C. on some other business, but would also check in to see if there were any chances for reparation. One thing that has to be um, made clear is that during the time this uh, experience was taking place and afterwards, the Aleuts felt that a great wrong had been done, but there were no resources available. And we couldn't, during the time, we couldn't get any answers from the authorities. None of our questions were answered. And so we lived with this experience, knowing that a great wrong had been done. So when Patrick Putnikoff told me that the attorneys in Washington, D.C., thought we had a chance for a good case, uh, he asked me to talk with as many Aleuts as I could about the World War II experience and the chance for reparation, which I did. And the first reaction was surprise on the part of the Aleuts to, when they knew that there was a chance that this wrong could be undone. And uh, then after uh, the executive director, acting executive director, Mike Saharoff and I testified in Washington, D.C. before the House uh, Judiciary Committee. And President Carter signed a bill into law in July 31st. Um, I, as the chairman of APIA's board of directors, formed a task force of um, partly uh, from the uh, board of directors of APIA and the Alley Corporation, and then we embraced other Aleuts that I knew were concerned, and uh, we called them at large members of the task force. And then we selected Alfred Stepanen uh, because of his capabilities as a project manager. and. Uh, so we have the large job of gathering evidence and putting it in suitable form for presentation at the hearings that the commission will be holding, of which Father is a member. And uh, they have chosen to deal with the Aleut portion of reparation in Seattle, Anchorage, St. Paul, and on Alaska. The dates for those meetings will be made known later. Father, would you like to say anything as an introductory remark? It's not necessary. Well, <clears throat> I wasn't involved in this at first, but one day Phil came to me and asked me if I wanted to serve on the committee uh, the, the reparation. Then I, I said, okay. Then he turned my name into APIA. And from there, they sent it into Senator Stevens' office, and they put in my name, and I was selected. And uh, after I, I was selected, I was informed from APIA that I was supposed to travel to Washington, D.C. And I went there and stayed there about five days, and we had our first meeting with the commission. Uh, there, were, there was a nine-member commission, commission, including me. And uh, at that time, uh, we chose uh, Joan Bernstein as a chair, chairperson. She's our chairperson, and uh, we're not really uh, starting to uh, uh, start the work yet because they're uh, in the process of making a new staff before we can continue. And I just uh, learned from the chairman that we'll, we'll they'll let us know within uh, maybe next week that what's going to happen and where the hearings will be held again. Maybe the first uh, hearings might be held in West Coast. Okay, stop the tape for a second. <coughs> All right. 
Um, Alfred, 1942. It was, uh, Dutch Harbor was bombed on June 3rd. It was several weeks before we even had a hint that we were to be evacuated. But soon the day came, they said, you're leaving tomorrow, and you're to take one suitcase of clothes. So everybody was preparing, and we were gathered on a truck and taken down to the dock and placed on a ship, and we left on Alaska. And our first stop was Kodiak to bury a little baby that was had been born in Alaska but died on the ship and we stopped at Kodiak for the burial. And we made several other stops in Southeastern before we reached our destination, which we never knew until we reached that it was going to be Wrangell. But it wasn't Wrangell proper, it was a, a small fishing camp, cannery about uh, 80 miles west of Wrangell. When we arrived in the camp, uh, yeah, um, we were all placed in one big two-story bunkhouse and were given uh, mattresses and blankets to sleep on. And <coughs> uh, they crowded about 180 of us in this one building for several days before they had prepared the other houses on in the camp to uh, made uh, fit to live in, which was not actually fit to live in. I ended up living in a, I would say a 15 by 20 uh, house with my aunt who had four children, myself and my two sisters, and an elderly woman from Alaska. There was no plumbing, and the only heat we had was a wood stove. And uh, our toilet was outside and was a common toilet used by the whole camp. I, there was always one thing on my mind during all this time, why us Aleuts had to be evacuated when the Caucasians could remain in the village. This has been on my mind since I was 14 years old. And uh, this question, I feel, should be answered by somebody. And. Uh, after I reached Wrangell, I was of uh, elementary school age. I mean, uh, yeah, elementary, no, <laughs> junior high school age. So I was uh, transferred to Wrangell Institute where I remained during the winters, returned to the camp in the summers until they uh, returned back to Alaska. <coughs> what, what 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 was the uh, when they moved you back to on Alaska? What did you find at home? I didn't immediately return with the evacuees. I returned a couple of years later. But when I returned, I found my mother's home ramshackled. Nothing, uh, nothing uh, fit to use in the house. What was there was either taken out or were, was uh, rotted from broken windows. And before the war, the uh, uh, we Aleuts subsisted on fish. And to make uh, to get this fish, we had to have dories and oars and nets. And when we were evacuated. All of these items had to be left here. We couldn't take them with us. And when we returned, 
the doors had either been stolen or rotted on the banks of the creek. And we never got any monies from the government in return for our losses. Fine. Gertrude, let's move to you. Could you just pick it up at 1942 and okay. what you remember from that incident? I was 12 years old and I guess we all remember different things. And uh, I remember leaving. And uh, of course for us kids it was a great big party, you know, but couldn't help noticing the sadness of the old people. Kind of wondered why my mom was crying. And, uh, I remember the trip down and uh, getting to Wrangell Institute. Really a different experience from this peaceful little village that we lived in, you know. And uh, we got there and they. Uh, lined us up in the gym and uh, they gave us a lice check <laughs> and it was it was humiliating <laughs> it was then again us kids were having fun but i could see tears in my mother's eyes you know and then then they made us go through showers you know first we we were all bathing on the ship and everything you know they we had, we, they forced us to go through showers. And by the time we got to showers, it was cold. It was okay for Billy and I, we were older. But my mama had to put the little kids through too, the showers, so. And our conditions there were crowded and the food was bad. And uh, um, from then on moving to Burnett Inlet, have different memories, as I say. I, my, the first night I was there, uh, stayed in this one little house, and and they're ramshackle. They're really not fit to live in. They were, you know, abandoned cannery houses, is what they were. And I don't know how long they've been abandoned. But the first night, I remember I counted them. There were 20 of us on the floor, and we didn't have any sleeping bags or anything like that. And uh, after that, we moved down to the bunkhouse. And uh, there wasn't too much food. It was mostly mostly starch, starchy foods like uh, macaroni or you know uh, rice and this and that. And we got there's no medical help. We had a uh, outbreak of boils. Everyone got boils. I don't know whether it was from the the diet that we were on or whatever, you know. And like a person would have 60 boils on their body. I think I only had 11 or something like that. But it was bad enough and they were so painful. But, you know, uh, we had a hard time solving the problem. I, I really don't know whether they ever solved it, you know. Maybe after they started catching fish and getting some fresh food and stuff that uh, they started going away. And let's see what else do I remember. Uh, it was, you know, it was quite different. It was uh, real primitive living. Quite different than what we were used to. Uh, the outhouses and packing the water and chopping the wood. And, uh, always the worry about uh, where the food was going to, where the next meal was going to come from. And no work for the men, and no work, no work for anyone to do or to make any money, you know. And uh, then we were sent off to Wrangell Institute, which was a school that had the capacity of 300 students, and they took, uh, you know, like uh, from the St. Paul people and uh, you know from all the islands. And that winter, there were over 700 kids in that school. And uh, it was cold, and we were hungry. There wasn't enough food. And 
I, I really remember it because I was homesick and hungry and uh, cold. Uh, we had an outbreak of measles and we all got sick. And <coughs> being in such close quarters, we all got lice. Um, but one thing I do remember is, uh, and I think that some of our old people died because they were so sad about being away from home. That yeah, really, you know, uh, it was really hard on the old people. It really was. Mm. What do you remember about the travels back to home, back and home. and and when you arrived there? Do you remember that? Well, yeah, I remember. Uh, well. I can always remember uh, always wishing on the star that we'd be able to go back home, <laughs> the first star, you know. And it was always in our minds. We were, you know, it was such a different, different thing down there for us. And uh, uh, finally, the day came that we did get on the ship. And uh, oh, the ship was crowded. And um, getting back home, uh, lots of the people uh, were taken up in the, the valley until their, their homes were, were made uh, suitable, you know, for them to stay in because they were just, uh, the, I suppose the GIs and everybody had gone through them and wrecked them and whatnot and they just weren't suitable for people to stay in. And uh, it took for quite a while before, before they were able to get back in to the house. What about my skiff, my dory? Uh, some guys had power dories, and, but mostly had oars. <laughs> uh, none of the questions were answered. We were always uh, referred to somebody of a higher rank, uh, and then, uh, we received the answer that what is happening to you is for your own protection. And that was as concrete an answer that we were able to get. Then we were put aboard a ship and we joined a convoy. And reaching southeastern Alaska for me was a new experience. I didn't like it because of the trees. I wasn't used to trees. I didn't like the trees because you couldn't see anywhere. And. Uh, then uh, I didn't like it because I had to attend the uh, BIA boarding school. I knew it wasn't a good school. And uh, I got as hungry as Gertrude did there. And I couldn't study what I wanted to. I tried to go to the uh, city of Wrangell's high school. I enrolled there. And uh, the principal of Wrangell Institute came and told me that as long as you're a ward of the government, you have to attend a government school. And so I had to leave my sister in the town of Wrangell and go back to Wrangell Institute. And uh, I didn't think that was enough reason. And then returning to Unalaska, uh, we were brought in from not this entrance, we were brought to a dock and Captain's Bay, the Army dock, large dock there. Then we were put on uh, six buys, Army trucks. And there was a long string of them bringing everybody in off the ship. And uh, I can still remember pe the people cheering and crying when we came over the hill and they saw the church in the town for the first time uh, after two and a half years. And and then it was a big disappointment to find that we couldn't go to our homes. We were placed in a holding area. Like Gertrude said, some of those were across the creek and others were uh, up in the valley and those were uh, Quonset huts and uh, cabanas. We were not allowed to go to our homes until they saw fit. and. Uh, I remember my family coming to our home, and we couldn't even get in 
house. It had been uh, broken into and had been vandalized. Our icons were gone, our pictures off the walls, the furnishings, um, uh, my toy biter, my seal skin, uh, I mean my seal intestine uh, raincoat and my uh, for hair seal boots, uh, they were gone. Everybody lost uh, things that were priceless because they were heirlooms. And uh, we had, my family had to rent a home when we were finally released from the holding area. We had to rent a home until we were able to build one out of two cabanas. The uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs managed to um, do what they called a, um, it, they didn't use the word reparation, uh, replacing is what they called it. And to the people who lost their homes, they took a big D8 and did their homes and piled them up and put them in a dump truck and hauled them off. And then they hauled two of these 16 by 20 cabanas and put them where, the, where our house was. They did that to all the places that weren't livable, and there were quite a few of those. Um, and uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs also put in their building material, paint, uh, roof, roofing paper, a plumbing, a wash tub, and a, um, a bathtub, a toilet bowl, sink, uh, furniture for the living room, bedroom, um, um, kitchen. But none of these things would have been chosen by the people if they had their choice. So even though they were dissatisfied, if they wanted a place to live, they had to create a home out of what they were given in uh, return for losing their other home. And uh, um, but I'd like to go back to uh, just before the air raids when they were giving, gi giving us uh, practice drills for uh, um, air raid alerts. They had a clock and that would go off. At first they let us go on to uh, trucks and when the uh, air raid siren went off we'd all run to the trucks and they'd take us up into the mountains. Uh, and then when it all clear sounded they brought us back until they built the two bomb shelters next to the bridge on the creek bank. And then all the people on one side of the road went to one bomb shelter, and all the people on the other side of the road went to the other bomb shelter. And by the time the Japanese came over, we were, you know, we weren't used to it, but we knew what we had to do and did it as rapidly as possible. The uh, alerts would come any time of the day or night. We also had to uh, conform to blackouts, not only in our homes, but in the church, because we have our services at night, and the men had to build blackout curtains for the church. And uh, military police always patrolled to see that nobody uh, broke the blackout things, and there was a curfew we were actually under martial law after um, Pearl Harbor. Martial law existed in Alaska. Um, we had to conform to a curfew, and we were not able to go berry picking, fishing, or hunting unless the military allowed us to. And we always had to account for every, for the time that we were gone. But coming home was a, a big disappointment to a lot of people because of the sh shape of their homes. But I, I know that uh, everybody felt like Gertrude did after seeing Southeastern Alaska. Uh, even before they got there, everybody was wondering when they could possibly go home. All they wanted to do was go home. They didn't want to stay where they were going or stay where they were taken. And always in the back of their minds was to go home. And that was uh, something that uh, 
we had to live with from that time on. And uh, the uh, reparation, you have to consider not only uh, the physical loss of property, like the heirloom, uh, the breakup of uh, the lifestyle and the interrupted life of every individual. I submit that the Aleut culture was halted for two and a half years. And when you do that to a people, the tremendous loss occurred. And we're not even talking about the psychological damage, which is an important part of what the Aleuts had to uh, endure. I've got a I've got a question here. Just that I'd like you to make a statement. Describe a cabana. What uh, is a cabana? cabana and where, is, who made it? Oh, the military, the army built cabanas for housing uh, their troops, and it's a sixteen by twenty wood frame uh, building with no uh, plumbing, no, and some wiring that had to be changed and. Uh, no insulation, and um, we could no longer get wood to uh, burn for heating and cooking, uh, and so everybody turned to wall for, for heating and cooking. Fine. Father. Yes, you want to start from 1942? Yes, those, those yes. Mm -hmm. But prior to that, I went to seminary in 1939 and came home. 1941, I remember I came in the old Penguin Fish and Wildlife Boat, stopped here, stayed here overnight, went to the Pribilofs, and a week later, they attacked Pearl Harbor. Well, we were in war then, after I got home. Then uh, a, year, a year after that, uh, we found out through the radio that uh, Anta Chapa was bombed. And a after that happened, uh, they uh, told us to, you know, black out our homes at night. And uh, I know I was 17 years old at that time. I know the elderly people were scared. They thought the Pribilovs would be hit too. So one day, 1942, I, I don't remember the day, I remember we were playing baseball and we saw a couple of boats in the horizon coming from St. George and, and the ball game stopped and we were just watching and thought they were Japanese boats were coming to attack us. It was really scary and then we found out it was a Liberty ship with a, a Coast Guard escort coming in to take us out. And uh, like these Alaska people said, we, they were, we were given 24 hours to, you know, to, to prepare to leave. But we were fortunate that they had these uh, seal barrels that they used for seal skins. We, each, each uh, family filled the, their belongings into it and uh, uh, prepared to leave. The, prior to that, when the boat came in, they, they told us only the the people that, that were working from outside, you know, Low 48, Caucasian were they're, they're the only ones that were taken off the islands. And I remember my dad really got upset, went to the office and raised heck. And after that, they found out that everybody was taken off the islands. I remember my dad worked in the canteen, and I remember as a boy, another kid said, yeah, you can go in there and take all the candy you want. Boy, I was happy <laughs> because we were leaving. And to me, I was a young boy. I thought, boy, it was a lot of fun, you know riding on the boat and see different people, but the elderly people, I know they were sad and, you know, worried. So they finally uh, took us aboard the, the following day. And, uh, yeah, they picked the people from St. George first, and they came to St. Paul and picked us up, and uh, we took off, and they uh, were heading for on Alaska here, but they... Uh, detected a submarine somewhere, so we had to go through Bristol Bay area, zigzag, and come through here. Then when we stopped here, we 
we picked up the people that were here from Atka. I remember the boat's name was Dalro. And we lived in uh, tight quarters, you know, the beds were so so high, that's all we were really. Yeah. Uh, stayed in like sardines, I remember. Every time they had a drill, we had to put on our life jackets and go out on the deck and be counted. And we couldn't, we couldn't waste any water. We had to save it on the ship and couldn't take a bath or showers or anything. So I remember after we left here, I don't know where our first stop was. I can't really remember, but I remember getting into uh, Thunder Bay. Prior to that, the Fish and Wildlife people were going to take all the people of people to Seattle. And I don't know how true this is, but they, you know, they spoke among themselves. What if we take these uh, sealers to Seattle? Maybe they'll never come back. We won't have any more sealers. So they decided to take us to Thunder Bay. It's about 40 miles from Juneau. I remember the day we got there, like Phil, as people say, <laughs> I didn't like the trees. They were, you know, I make you feel like I uh, had a claustrophobia. You know, you felt you were pushed in by the trees. So I, I stayed on the boat last, finally got on the barge and went, went, went to shore with the people. And they put us into an old abandoned uh, cannery there at Thunder Bay. I remember there was about six or seven hundred people in that one two-story building. We were really crowded there. I remember I, at when night came, I remember I slept under a table for the night. And I went to stay there three days and finally my dad was given a smaller house so we moved in there. It was a little better. And, uh, and I was put to work as a waiter in that place at that place I just mentioned. And we used to go down to the beach, get clams, clean them. I really got tired of clams. We had to eat them almost three times a day sometimes. Because when we first came there, I guess they didn't have much, any much uh, grocers or anything. So finally, uh, two weeks later, the fish and wildlife boat came and bought uh, some grocers. And uh, we were quite restricted couldn't go out, you know, as you want. I was still in front of me. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I remember we stayed in those, uh, that two-story structure for about a couple of days with the St. George people. Then they decided, then they had another one across the bay. So they moved the people over at St. George. So we call it St. Paul and St. George site. And after that, it got a little better because Prior to that, we used to stay in long line just to eat, you know, three meals a day. We had two or three cooks there, and I, uh, I worked as a waiter at that time. And I, I remember eating a lot of clams. I almost, I almost got tired of them. And uh, after we, we got there, the men were put to repair the, the that big building. Then, about uh, half a year or seven months later, they brought lumber. I don't know where they bought the lumber from, but the fish and wildlife bought in lumber, so they started building better homes, newer homes in that in that cannery there. And we didn't have any uh, toilets or anything. There were out, out, outhouses that we used. And I don't know how good the water was, but we, we drank it. And while I was there, a lot of older people died from that uh, that the, uh, they didn't get their died or they, they got sick with the flu and they died. But I remember some of them were already sick when they left the privilege off, so they, they got sick and died. I don't remember seeing a doctor there at the first year. I don't think we didn't have any. But at least we had uh, two priests uh, that came down with us from St. Paul and St. George, Father Baranov and uh, Father Theodosius, I remember we used to hold uh, services on the boat uh, Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. And, uh, and finally, after a year, I think they built a small chapel there in Thunder Bay. They used to hold services there. I, I lived in Thunder Bay about six or seven months, and my dad moved to Juneau. 
he got a job in June, so I moved with him and stayed there and worked in the Baron of Hotel as a busboy. And uh, while I was there, I got drafted in the Army. So I served the Army in uh, Fort Richardson and uh, Whittier. I stayed in the uh, Port Company for about 12, 18 months unloading boats. The first year, 1943, we went up to the Pribilofs uh, as uh, soldiers because they, they were sort of men, so they asked uh, all the boys that were uh, uh, drafted. We went up to the Pribilofs and had sealing up there, catch the seals. So they didn't catch any seals in, in 1942. When we came back in '43, they had a big catch then, about 117,000 pelts were taken. And at that time, I, uh, I just got paid army pay. I didn't get any extra money or bonuses from that catch. Remember, they used to pay the alleys 20 cents a pelt, and when they sold it, it was $100 a skin. So we really, really lose out. And they told us, uh, when we asked about it, they said we could, we'd be paid after we got on, out of the army. I never saw the money. Then, then I went back into the army in the following year, 1944. Uh, I went on the same boat. The uh, Pribilov people were going back to back to the islands, and when we got there, the the homes were ransacked, and all the furnitures and everything put in one, put in some of the smaller buildings and just piled up. You know, every, uh, from house to house, so they're all mixed. We don't know who it belonged to. So they really made a, made a mess up there. So one thing I, I can't understand is uh, when the Japanese moved out the Aleutians, why didn't they send us home right away? They kept us down there for another year. I think I know why it's best in Pribilovs. They used uh, our homes as, uh, you know, military housing, I think that's why. They didn't take us back right away. As soon as the Japanese left the islands, uh, they could have brought us back within a year. No, but they kept us there another year. The same here, I think the army used the, the buildings here as a military outpost. But uh, but they built their own stuff, you know, like squads and huts all over the chain. And it's a mess now. If I've seen flying over Kobe, the old huts around here, and uh, but I I can't remember getting money in the Pribilofs, like being paid back. I I don't remember that. I remember uh, the people were asked to write down what they lost. You know, I mean, I remember my dad did that. What he lost in the house. I remember when they came to the islands in 1943, they used my house as an office. Yes, it was an officer's uh, you know, office for their duties, I guess. A couple of questions here. Um, who told you when you were when you were working in uh, sealing, who told you that you would be paid later? Well, that, that was the superintendent of the island Fish and Wildlife Service. He's, he's dead now, Edward Johnson. Well, we were under the Fish and Wildlife Service when we were evacuated. Who, to who asked you to write down what your losses were after the war? I think it was the Fish and Wildlife service. I'm sure, or I don't know if it was the BIA, or I think it was Bistola. Who informed you that you would be leaving the island? When we were evacuated, the Navy did. Who was responsible for you, or who was in charge while you were on the ship being transported to Southeast? Well, actually, I think it was the, we were under the Navy at that time. but. Uh, the personnel of the Fish and Wildlife went with us. They were evacuated too, but the 
they uh, ended up in Seattle, not in front of me. Who was responsible for you in Southeast? Fish and Wildlife Service. Can I ask that same question of you, Phil? Sure. Okay. Who was responsible? No, I'm sorry. Who told you that you would have to leave the island? The um, military police informed the different people. And uh, then we found the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, uh, people uh, were responsible for us after our trip down. During our trip down, we were on an old Alaska steamship line um, steamer. Is it the Alaska? I think it was, the name of it was the Alaska. And uh, when we got down there, the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, handled everything that happened to us uh, and our stay down there and our return. And it's interesting to note that during the research of uh, exactly what happened, the Bureau of Indian Affairs refused to uh, release any records of the what they did with the Aleuts during that evacuation period. And the bill that the President signed calls for the Bureau of Indian Affairs to re release those records. All of the records pertaining to the move of the Pribilovians uh, have been found and um, copies of the log that was kept on a daily basis have been found, but no trace of any records of what happened to the people on the chain uh, until the commission requests them. Then they will have to turn them over. <clears throat> okay. Who was in charge of you while you were in Southeast? The Bureau of Indian Affairs. We had a man and his wife, and the men were allowed to build a church. That's the first thing that the people wanted. And they built a church, small chapel, and they built a school. Who was in charge? Who brought you back? The Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the man that was in charge of the move was named Cobalt, C-O-B-A-L-T. <clears throat> Were you asked to write down the, the, the damages on, upon your return to your home? Uh, no. Um, uh, some of the leaders in, in Alaska uh, wanted, wanted to do that, but there was, they didn't know where to send it. and. Uh, no answers were given. Who can I replace these things we've lost? And almost everybody lost something, but they never got a sufficient answer. And that was a uh, bone of contention that Mr. Cobalt was very uncomfortable with. Fine. Okay, Alfred. Uh, oh, okay, hold on. Could you cut for just a moment? I think that Al wanted. To see if we could bring out was uh, who was responsible for you upon your return, and when did they think their responsibility and when in fact? <clears throat> well, as I said before, we were uh, put in a holding area, and uh, that may have been two weeks. It may have been a little bit longer, um, but we were not allowed to return. It was only after the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs man made sure that some kind of what he called, uh, he called it something else, he had a name, uh, like uh, compensation, to compensate for the loss of your home. Oh, we're, we're giving you these two cabanas and here's all the stuff like that. It was after everybody who couldn't move back into their original home and their original homes had been replaced by these two uh, 16 by 20 frame, wood frame buildings. It was uh, after that time that uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs decided to leave us. I mean, we never heard of him.
Gertrude, could you could you tell us about the education, educational facilities? Okay. Why? Uh, well, like I said, it was very crowded, and uh, I was in the seventh grade, and uh, the classrooms were just so crowded that uh, it was impossible to even hear the teacher at times. And when I went back the next year, it was still overcrowded and uh, like they would take the ones with the highest grades and put them into the next class, not because it, they should have been. Like I missed my eighth grade because they did that. And I uh, missed all my grammar and arithmetic that I should have had and I shouldn't have been passed on. You know, there were several of us the same way. Um, I don't know what else I could say about it, except that uh, it was very poor education. We, we really lost, I mean, and really when we, to go on to school, it was impossible because we had missed so much during those years. Just on basics, you know, just on basics. Probably Alfred can come oh. on with that, really. Okay, Alfred, would you like to say something? education. Cut for just yeah. a moment, if you would. Turn up. Stand by. As Gertrude said, I was a sixth grader when I got to Wrangell. <laughs> and within three days, I was a eighth grader because I had better grades on my daily test or whatever it was they were giving me. And I found myself in a group of older children, and it was hard to concentrate when you feel like you were a, 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 a young kid among older people. And this really affected my education for several years. And. Uh, Again, as Philman said earlier, um, the culture of the Aleuts was affected. Not only before the war, they would have traditional Aleut parties, and we tried to keep them up in Burnett. The older people tried, but somehow the jute box came into our lives more than the Aleut traditions, and it was lost, and it has Cut. Okay, we're just about ready to begin. Uh, I hope this uh, talks we just had tonight will, uh, will come out in, through the commission I'm on, so we, be, we will be compensated through monies or this through something that that uh, th something like this will never happen again. Like wh what if World War Three starts? My name is Gromo. They probably lock me up. Because <laughs> 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 I have a Russian name. <laughs> I hope that never happens. <laughs> That's, That's a good point. Uh, it's been happening ever since history, I guess. The United States did the Japanese, they did the Mexicans, so forth, and finally did it to us. I think if they kept us here in the Aleutians and the Pueblos, I don't think we'd, we wouldn't have been hurt that much because the Japanese did uh, try to take the, this area itself, but they stayed in Kiska for a while, they moved out. Uh, and that's it. Cut. Cut. Hold on, sir. A very old lady who was very vocal, although she didn't have a good command of the English language, uh, didn't like any part of the move. And uh, when she still had a good health, 
she talked to Gertrude's mother and my mother and the other leaders in Burnett Inlet and made them promise that when, if she died down there, she would not be buried there. One of our older ladies died in a hospital in Ketchikan. A young man died of tuberculosis at Burnett Inlet, and he was buried there in that wet, damp forest. Damp, that word it was. And uh, she didn't want that to happen to her. And so when she did die, natural causes, her body was sent to Wrangell, where it was embalmed, and then returned to Burnett. And it's placed under the church until we were brought back to uh, on Alaska. When her body was placed under the church, nobody knew when we'd be coming back. But um, after we, we had a hard time getting the body on the ship that came to bring us back because the people on the ship said, hey, we're supposed to only take live people. You know, what are you doing with this body or this coffin? And the uh, people in Burnett uh, were aggressive enough to convince the people that they either did not, you know, either took that woman or nobody would go. And the same thing happened when we docked up there. The military and the BIA people who met us uh, also had trouble accepting this woman's body. And then uh, they put her in a deep freeze and kept her there until they found out there wasn't too much that they could do about it. And even during the time that we were in the holding area, she was kept in a deep freeze. And it wasn't until the church furnishings were replaced and the church was put back into order that that lady was finally buried in Alaska according to her, her wishes. But she made it clear that it didn't matter when she died, she would not be buried down there. What was her name? Martha. Um, Newell. Newell. <laughs> Newell. I tried to say it. Okay. Okay.